Welcome to Listen In. I'm Brian Gahan, and this podcast focuses on the stories that are buried deep inside all conversations. Be it the kind of conversation you have with someone whose life experience is full of interesting POVs and insights, or the kind of conversation you have inside your own head around your own life experiences. Today, in episode 5, I'm talking with Jay Ferguson, a Canadian film and content producer. In part one of our conversation, Jay goes deep into his career motivations and what it's been like navigating his journey as a visual storyteller. Whether it's being on the bleeding edge of innovation or challenging his own approach to storytelling, Jay's first-hand perspective is a gift for anyone wanting to start their own storytelling journey. Hey Jay, welcome to Listen In. <laughs> Sorry, so, I, I'll start again. Yeah. Well, well, we're just going to start. I wasn't expecting to have to answer so quickly. <laughs> it, 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 this audio only is very complicated. You're yeah. so used to allowing somebody to sit in the chair and look awkward, and that's all part of the setup. I'm right? waiting for my cue, yeah. uh, and but I guess that was a pretty <laughs> clear cue, so let me try again. Hey, Jay, welcome to Listen In. Thanks for having me, Brian. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm really glad to have you and get this chance to do a little bit of a deep dive into your career. My first question for you is, when you describe what you do to people, how do you sum that up? Oh, that is a terrible question. Uh, I I never know how to describe what I do, to be totally honest. Uh, I work in... I always say I just work in the film and television business, but the problem is that I never know what to say because I kind of do a lot of stuff in the business. So everything from, you know, I started in many ways as a cinematographer and now I'm more of a producer. So it's like, uh, and I'm a writer and I'm a director and, uh, and, and I, I work in commercials and I work in films and I work in television and reality and all this sort of stuff. So it's like really, really difficult, uh, to describe it or sum it all up in once. But if I had to, for the purposes of editing <laughs> of, a, of a tax form or a yeah. bank, you know, a bank account, I, I often more and more now, you know, I, I was at the doctors the other day, I had a physiotherapist and it says you know write down what you do and it's like you know you don't want to spend a lot of time uh, on these forms and so I wrote film producer that was what I wrote down I just thought I'm just going to write film producer down because that seems like maybe the easiest way out and but also now that I think about it that you're asking me it's kind of sad because I never wanted to be a film producer (laughs) and I never ever in a form would have ever written anything like film producer on it but I think that the sad state of my career is that the truth is that I actually am a film producer now and it's like I never intended it to be this way, and that's what it's become. Well, it's it, it's funny because it's almost like, has it become that because the internet and the different devices that we look at entertainment on are so diverse now, and the types of, you know, videographers and YouTubers and this, you know, it's confusing. So you're kind of going back to a term that solidifies it to, you know, something in people's brains, like, oh, you get what I do. You know, it's interesting. First of all, actually, film producer is in many ways a lie uh, because, A, uh, we don't work in film anymore. It doesn't exist. Uh, And producer uh, connotates that uh, something's getting done. And uh, when I look at my day-to-day life, it feels like nothing's getting done. Uh, So it's like, am I a film producer? Am uh, some people say content creator? Um, I guess maybe that's more like to your point. It's like creating content is is what I do more than anything. Uh, film producers like me sounding like an old guy looking <laughs> for a label. Content creator is probably more likely uh, what it is because you know it's it, and like you said, it's we work in so many different genres and uh you know nobody does just one thing anymore and so because because i work in so many different avenues it's like that would be so hi my (laughs) name is jay ferguson and i am a content creator oh interesting okay cool well that leads me to the question to go back in in time a bit and let's talk about how you 
how that journey happened for you. Like, how did you end up, as you said, you were a cinematographer, you were a filmmaker, you be, you became a writer, you you produce, you you do everything now. But how, how did that journey work for you? Yeah, it's definitely a journey. Um, uh, yeah, how do you end up being a producer? So first of all, a producer is somebody who uh, does a lot of uh, paperwork and takes a lot of meetings and is creative in their own right, but not the creativity that we imagine when we're getting into the film business. You know, it's like st on set saying action and cut and working with actors and, you know, writing and all that sort of what we imagine to be core, creative, exciting things that we all want to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, I spent a lot of time dealing with CRA and tax audits, you know, like <laughs> this is, this is like, uh, not uh, glamorous um, but uh, and the fact is is that I, I am being a bit hard on myself while I am producing a lot I'm also doing a lot of creative stuff as well which I'm sure we'll talk about but uh, the fact is is that I, I started very much uh, in the theater so I actually started with a theater background which is like a very purely creative uh, uh, endeavor in many ways um, and then I discovered uh, film and the language of uh, storytelling through visuals, and I became fascinated with that. And so uh, I, I started working as a cinematographer uh, because I felt like I needed to understand that language because it's very different from the theatrical language where, you know, a bunch of people are in a room telling a story. It's like, how do you tell a story when suddenly you have lenses and cameras and, uh, and, 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 and different locations? Like, it's a whole other language, so I had to learn that language. Um, I became a cinematographer by accident, actually. I, I really didn't want to be a cinematographer. I, my goal was always to write and direct. And what happened was that I felt like I really needed to learn how to be, like I had to learn the language. So in trying to learn that language, I ended up doing a lot of cinematography and I got, you know, semi-decent at it and people kept hiring me to do it. And so I suddenly became a cinematographer all the while, though, my plan was always, I mean, during that whole process, I was still always writing and making my own films. And then eventually I moved out of cinematography and more into writing and directing. But the thing, here's the thing, is that, you know, this is a, in Canada, our business is kind of a stupid business. And it's a really, really hard, difficult business. There's not a lot of money uh, the dream of just being a writer director is, uh, very much a dream. Not, it doesn't happen for a lot of people. I'm going to be a writer director and somebody else is going to produce my material. What ends up happening, and this is more and more and more increasingly true, is that you have to be your own producer. You have to create your own, your own opportunities. And so for me as an independent filmmaker, you know, 20 years ago, that was exactly what I had to do is that I had to become a producer in order to get the stuff done because people weren't just showing up at my door and saying, hey, you know, can <laughs> I spend my life trying to raise money so that you can, you know, uh, make your projects. Um, so, uh, so I had to develop these projects producer skills. Um, I've worked over the years with producers who I've learned from and are amazing producers. Uh, but that's, but the fact is, is that I, you, you, in many ways, creatively in the arts, I think in general, in the arts, in, in this country, especially, and in most countries, you just gotta like, you gotta, you gotta have some savvy and work hard and be a producer in order to be creative. Right. So, so you said that you kind of, you know, wanted to learn how to tell stories in the language of film where you said there's lenses and locations and that sort of thing. And so explain that to the lay person. What does that mean? You know, like when you say like telling a story through lenses and locations and, you know, is as opposed to being in theater where it's all happening on a stage, right? 
Yeah, I mean, my experience in theater was so I I wasn't writing content in the theater. I was like taking plays, like great plays, like uh, plays like Agnes of God, or, uh, or or plays like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that are these like brilliantly crafted, honed stories, and then putting them on stage uh, as a director. Um, and uh, and it was like okay, like the story, you don't have to worry about it; it's already there. Um, but it is a group of people telling a story in front of an audience and it's this communal experience, uh, that happens on stage. And also let me tell you, actually, this is really important. I'm still trying to figure out how to tell stories in the language of cinema. Like I spend most of my days trying to figure out how to actually tell a story properly. Like I feel like I've been... I've been doing it for a long, long time, and I just really feel like I still, I'm getting a little bit better at it, but I just feel like every day as I sit down and try and hammer something new together, it's like I'm constantly trying to figure out how to tell the story. It's such a complicated process, and I think that no matter no matter what the, uh, uh, the medium is, it's like, for me, obviously, it's about uh, storytelling through cameras, and sound. And so to talk about storytelling, um, you know, storytelling at its most fundamental is about when we sit down across from each other and we tell each other a story. How was your day? And it's like some people are really good at telling you how their day was and some people are terrible at it. And that's just the basic fundamentals of storytelling. And I'm not suggesting that I'm necessarily good at telling you how my day was. <laughs> Uh, but some people can really make a terrible day sound interesting, you know, or a mundane day sound interesting. So for, for, for me, uh, that gets, you know, uh, exponentially more complicated when you start adding in technologies and fiction and all the stuff. So if you're talking about, uh, film or let's say visual arts of storytelling, and I work in a really pretty traditional one, so it's not experimental. It's really about characters telling stories and how do we start at A and work our way along slowly to the conclusion of the story. Um, in film and television, there are so many stages along that path. Uh, there are so many different tools that you can that you need to use or that you can use in order to tell that story. On the most basic level, there's dialogue, there's performance of actors, there's use of the camera, meaning how how you frame something. Uh, there's the editing. There's the score. There's a voiceover if you have it. Um, there's lighting. All these things are tools in your toolkit. So it's like if you're painting a painting and you wanted to get set the tone of something gloomy, it's like you have this color palette that you right. choose from. And in 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 the filmmaking process, it's exactly the same thing. But it's instead of just choosing a green or an orange, it's like you're choosing maybe a sound effect or a line of dialogue to tell that story. And to me, this is uh, this is well, because that's such a complicated mixture of things. Uh, it's like this lifelong pursuit that I'm constantly trying to understand because it's like, do I tell the story with a, a, a visual cue or do I do it with a, a, a dialogue cue? Do I do it with a s audio cue? You know, um, I'm working on this thing right now and I'm doing something in it that I've never really done before. And that's that I'm putting a bunch of pop music into the script. So it's at the script process, but I'm putting pop music in like, like songs that raise an energy level. And I've never done that before. But the thing that's interesting about that is that that's just a small example of a tool that can, you know, is going to invoke in the audience this excitement mm -hmm. about what's going on on the screen because you've got a Sly and the Family Stone song playing. And that takes care of everything as opposed to, you know, there are other tools to do that. You could have characters, you know, 
having fun in dialogue and like talking about how exciting the city is, but it's like you, or you can get rid of that and you could have this pop song playing or you could, you know, I mean like there's, there's a million ways yeah. the way you light it or the, the way the costumes are, everybody's really bright and the camera's moving swishy and there's a, a shot of the camera going over in a, in a drone shot. It's like, like there's so many different ways you can make like the city seem exciting. Um, this is the way I'm choosing to do it in this in this particular project but the point is is that this language is so complicated and 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 so so understanding how those pieces all work together because if i can say one of the traps you can fall into and i always say that there's a huge trap is that you um uh and that can then become insulting to an audience is when you um when you overstate that idea. So like, right. so like I want to say the city's exciting or, 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 or no, let, let me use a different example because it's more emotional. A character is sad. So there's lots of different ways you can show a character being sad. Um, but if you have a sad soundtrack and then a character saying in the dialogue, I'm sad. And then the character's also crying and then there's really moody, dark lighting. And then the voiceover of the character says, I'm really sad. And it's like, and suddenly you, everything is saying sad. It's like that becomes insulting to the audience. You know, you, the audience in the end is going to go, yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it. I yeah, get you it. want I, yeah. I get it. He's sad. But the fact is, is that you may be able to just say they're sad simply by showing that they have bloodshot eyes and you track in slowly and on, on their face and they show no emotion whatsoever. And the audience is going to go, wow, like they look kind of sad, you mm -hmm. know, or what you cut it with. Uh, so it's like, t to me, that, that language, like, I mean, I could, I've probably already spoken too long about it, but the fact is, is that I could probably talk for hours about mm -hmm. that balance of trying to be able to like say something but at the same time, uh, not overstated. Right. And I, I mean, this, this brings to mind a, a book I read about the Coen brothers and how they storyboard everything. And then when they go to shoot, it's literally like, no, we're shooting exactly the storyboard and their films are, are so great. And you sort of realize like they have figured it out. Like, oh, it's, as you said, it's the, in these days, it's the drone shot over the car or something, or it's, it's the light in the, in the laneway, or it's the dialogue. Like they pick the one thing way back in the storyboard stage that they figured out is the way they want to communicate that emotion or that feeling to the audience. And, and so when you're writing, you're having to think about all of that stuff, you know? And I think that the average lay person thinks that writers just sit down and bang a story out and it comes out and, and they haven't gone to that detail, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it depends, you know, because it's like sometimes, you know, you write a, a script and I've written scripts that other people have directed. Uh, and, and mostly I've written scripts that I've directed. And what's really interesting is that when you're writing something that you're going to direct... It's like you have a pretty good sense of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and how you're going to achieve it. But when you're writing for somebody else, they're going to take your template uh, and 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 they're going to figure out how they're going to get that emotional feeling across to the audience. So uh, so it can be like, like you're talking, you know, you're talking about the Coens who are the best. Uh, I would also then p like talk about Alfred Hitchcock. I mean some of these 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 two filmmaking entities they like i mean they know exactly how the impact is going to happen way in advance right uh, uh certain filmmakers can really do that and they know that we need a close up here or we need to not have a close up here in order to convey what they want to convey to the audience and that's about cinema language that's about knowing it so if you're writing something that you're going to see through to the end that you're going to also shoot or direct and edit and know where all the sound cues are going and all that sort of stuff. It's like, uh, if, if you can envision that all the way through, um, then yeah, you can really do it from the screenwriting process. Like in the screenplay, you can build that stuff in. I mean, I mean, just the choice of when you're going to have a close up versus a wide shot 
like that has huge emotional impact on the audience. Like it really does. We think it may be just like, oh, just cut into a close up or whatever, but it's like choosing to cut to a close up or not cut to a close up has ramifications in terms of the storytelling all the way along, you know. And do you ever, you know, go through that in a movie theater or when you're watching somebody else's work and you just go, "Oh, why did they do that?" Or, you know, have, has does that happen to you? Where you think, oh, I would have done that differently or... Oh, for sure. Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, it's interesting. I don't find myself saying like, I would have done that differently. What I often find is like where uh, I see uh, this happening where where maybe you think like, oh, that... I feel like that didn't convey what the filmmaker was trying to convey. Like that led me down the wrong path, you know, right. like, whereas, you know, I mean, the worst possible example of this happening, and it doesn't happen very often, but is like where you do something that causes the audience to laugh when they're supposed to be <laughs> upset, you know, it's like where you go like, oh, you know, why did you cut to that? Or why did you uh, do that certain thing when, uh, when when it, when you you know it evokes the wrong thing in the audience what i do find often is that for me and i'm a very visual person uh is that when it's done right uh i'll never forget those shots like like if i'm watching a movie and it's like and 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 the storytelling is just done perfectly it's like i will remember the sequence of shots in my head like I'll never forget them for years to come because they're just because they're just so perfectly put together or they touched me just perfectly. Nice. So you know what the next question is? Do you, do you have an example of one of those moments? I, I actually I, the first two things. There's two things that pop in my mind. One is actually, uh, and I would say I'll get more specific, but the movie Goodfellas <laughs> to me was just like a perfect storytelling. Uh, entity like like whether you like the subject matter or not the fact is is that the craftsmanship in this project in terms of bringing all the storytelling language together is perfect and conveys exactly what the filmmakers are trying to convey there is in particular about two thirds of the way through the movie, there's a sequence, which I kind of refer to it as the helicopter sequence, which is like this. It's, I think it's actually about 20 minutes long. Really? Uh, so it's not just a short thing, but it's about 20 minutes long. And, um, and, uh, there, uh, I know that sequence sort of inside and out. And when I first saw it, it was like, wow, this really uses every piece of language in order uh, to tell the story of what's going on and to invoke in the audience a certain feeling. To be really super specific, and I don't know why this just came to my mind, but um, uh, of all things, and, and this is maybe a good example because it's it's simple and it's something probably most people have seen because maybe not everybody's seen Goodfellas, but is... Um, uh, in the 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 Batman movie, the uh, Christopher Nolan one, the second one, the one with the Joker, mm -hmm. I remember at the very beginning the the introduction of the character of the Joker. Uh, they're doing a bank heist, and there's the shot. Uh, there's it's like maybe the third shot of the film, or it's within the first five or six shots of the film. There's a shot. And you don't know it's the Joker. There's just a guy walking along the street as this stuff is starting to happen. And it was like the way that shot was put together in combination with the way the actor was holding themselves, uh, uh, the way that it was all put together. It was like, I remember my head going, and this was really fun for me because I remember going, this character is important and I don't know why this character is important, but I need to watch this character and there's something going on. And again, this is like at least 10 or 15 years ago that this movie came out. But I remember going like, okay, 
I was compelled to want to know what this character was going to do, even though it could have been an establishing shot, but it was like just snuck in there in such a perfect mm. way that I was like, and, th and then when it turned out that that was the character, that that was the bad guy that I was going to get involved with in, in this story, I was like, oh man, they totally set that up so perfectly that I wanted to look at that person. I wanted to see what they were doing. So, and that was like, that was like a posture and a camera angle mm -hmm. and it was like and they got me you know yeah and and that that's happened to me in other movies and i can't think of them to give an example but it's where they do something that sends a message to me that oh this is an important scene or this is an important person and then nothing comes from it and at the end of the movie i'm walking out going but what about that guy or that woman who, totally. you know, like, why did we spend so much time on them or whatever? And you don't know if it happened in the edit or if you don't know if they didn't even notice that they were doing that. But as the audience member, I'm just like, I want to know more about why that shot was there. It, it, it's totally true. And it's like, and that's the problem. Like those kind of red herrings, it's like, you have to know. To me, I think the most important thing as a storyteller or a filmmaker or whatever you want to call yourself um, is that you don't send your audience down the wrong path, that you don't suddenly focus on something that doesn't pay off unless that's what you're trying to do. But like for the most part, that's not what we want to do. We don't want to throw red herrings. I mean, unless you're doing a thriller or whatever, uh, and then you use that language to your advantage. But I totally, totally know what you're talking about. It's like, and you go like, and, that, and you just said something that's like, probably the worst criticism of film where you go like, why do they do that? It must have been in the editing <laughs> because they had to work around some other problem. Yeah. But it's like, no. You no. don't want to think that. It, yeah. it was like, yeah, it's like, please don't anybody ever watch something I did and go, oh, uh, it was fine. But I'm sure they were working around some problem to because that thing happened. But yeah, it's like, it's so easy to send the audience down the wrong path. You know, there's just like, there, there's just like, uh, you have to be so careful. You have to be so careful, and and you have to make sure that you're not going like, okay, now I'm uh, now I'm uh, now I'm gonna do this, or I'm gonna focus on this thing, and it's like, eh, why are you focusing on it? You know. Yeah. I'm talking with Canadian film and content producer Jay Ferguson, who's sharing his process of creating something that is believable out of nothing that is real so that the audience believes it's true. Well, the thing that I find fascinating about your career is that you've dabbled, not dabbled, that's the wrong word, sorry, that you've dove into so many aspects of storytelling. And, you know, it takes me back to that quote by Picasso, I think, who said it, that you have to master the details like a pro so you can break them as an artist. And, um, and so there's that mastery of, of filmmaking and storytelling that has to be learned, you know, to, in order to break it. And, and, and something that comes up for me is around lighting, you know, because, you know, my background in advertising, there's a lot of photography, still photography, and, and a lot of still photography will go like, you can tell where the light's coming from. You can tell that we are, you know, doing this on purpose, whether it's a hard light or it's something that's contradictory or it's a colored light. And then in, in great filmmaking, it's like you told me one time, like the goal is to not know where the light came from, you know, and that's such a skill to then be able to sort of then go and say, okay, well now I'm going to play with that for art reasons or whatever. Yeah, I mean, like, this is the thing. It's like, it's all artifice in the end, right? It's like, you sit down and you're watching this thing on a box, on a screen, whatever it is, and it's like, it's a bunch of actors saying fake words, and it's, I mean, when you look outside the frame of any uh, filmed project, it's like, there's lights, and there's crews, and there's like, people standing there eating, you know, <laughs> stale baguettes you know it's like it's like it, it's it's this incredible thing that when it all comes down to what's inside this frame that there's actually something true going on in there to me is like it's almost like impossible like every setup is like this huge puzzle to <laughs> create something real out of stuff that is just none of it is real it's as far from real as you can possibly get and um i think that so in light, where if you can feel the lighting hitting you, 
uh, or hitting your actor, it's going to take the audience out of it. So it's like if you if I just take a, a big light and blare it at, at, at an actor and it's this hard, awful light, you know, even audiences who aren't sophisticated are going to go like, oh, that doesn't look natural, you know, and it'll feel fake. Now, obviously, there's times to use that because you want it to look like somebody shining a news light on somebody right. or whatever. But the fact is, is that in terms of lighting, the lighting needs to obviously fit what's happening emotionally. But I feel that way about every aspect of the process. It's like, you know, we've all seen bad performances in in, in films and it's like that takes you out of it. Uh, you, you, you know, you, you see... Uh, a camera move that's bumpy and draws attention to itself. And it's like, okay, that uh, takes me out of it. Uh, dialogue that's stilted, that mm-hmm. takes me out of it. Uh, music that's saccharine and terrible, that takes me out of it. It's like every one of these, it's like, it, it really is like, you know, there are so many pitfalls, like in a way, it, it's like every shot that you want to get And I'm sure this is the same for you in advertising, right? It's Mm -hmm. like in order to create something genuine at the end of the day, it's like you're just like navigating a minefield of problems of, you know, things being disingenuous. Right. Because along the way, you've got to make sure that 97 things are all coming together to be genuine. And if one of them is disingenuous... Then it's a problem. And look, I've certainly, obviously, you're not going to hit it out of the park every time. And I've certainly sat in the edit suite. And let me go right back to our (laughs) idea of like, oh my God, they fix it in the editing, where you're like going, oh, you know what? Like that particular element of that shot really makes this seem fake to me. You know, and it could just be like, it could be the way an extra is moving in the background. In fact, actually, one of the last projects I did, we had this extra who, like it was a police station, right? And it was like the lobby of a police station. And we had this extra in the, sort of in the foreground, but was like part of every establishing shot that like just looked like the fakest cop, right? (laughs) And I kind of didn't catch it. We were shooting this thing. It was like almost lunchtime. We had like 10 minutes to get the scene. It was like one of those things where it was like you, you want to get a strong performance out of the main characters and, and, and you don't necessarily have the moment to think everything through. And I remember when we were shooting it, it was like, I thought that guy is terrible. And it was like, but, but it was like, you just, tuck it into the back of your mind because you're just, you know, you got 10 minutes to get this thing. And I remember when we were cutting, it was like, we were looking at it. And it was like that guy, that guy, just the way he walked, he had this kind of like, it was all black and he had like a gun holster on. And he was like walking like, you know, somebody who wasn't an actor would thinks that like a cop would walk. And it was just so phony. And I remember the whole time we were cutting, trying to cut around it. It was like, how do we cut around this thing because that one detail just made you as an audience member go like uh yeah this is so cheap you know this is like really bad anyways we cut around it it was fine but but that's like one tiny one tiny detail of how it can all go so wrong and the performances are great and everything the lighting was good all the other stuff was working but it was like that one little detail. Yeah, it's it's funny. I just watched the Green Book, and, and of course, it's a period piece, and 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 maybe it's just because of my background. But on every establishing shot or every kind of wide shot, I don't go to the principal actors. I always go to like what's going on in the background. Like, are those all those cars exactly the right cars? You know, are those people all dressed right? right. Does that building have? And so they do this, this, um, it was probably a drone shot in the old days. It'd be a helicopter shot of them, uh, leaving New York and they're driving across. I, I think it's the Verazero, whatever the name is, bridge that goes between Staten Island and, and Manhattan, right? The double decker bridge. Mm. So they're driving across this bridge and they're blurring somehow through speed all the other cars on this bridge so that you know that they you know because they haven't they have they don't have that they're a big budget film but they don't have that kind of budget to shut the whole bridge down i don't think so so in those moments my eye is like okay where's the slip up 
when am I going to see, you know, the car or the truck that's not from that time? Right. And it's interesting. It would be interesting to know, like, how many people subconsciously get that, you know, like how many people are suddenly taken out of the storytelling experience? Um, uh, it's interesting. You talk about period pieces. It reminds me of another Martin Scorsese story. So uh, I can praise Goodfellas for all its incredible <laughs> uh, uh, magic of, of storytelling and where I was completely captivated and bought it from beginning to end then I remember going to see a movie called Gangs of New York yes. and it was like and it was like you know what when I watch Daniel Day Lewis in Gangs of New York I buy that this is a story that takes place at a certain time but it was like when I saw uh, um, uh, what's her name uh, Cameron Diaz I was like eh I don't believe she exists at that time you know like, like there's something about her physically that I was like, and maybe it's just because of pop culture and who she is and whatever, but it's like, you know, casting is really important. And it's like, do I buy that this is taking place at a certain time? Right. Because Look, it's the reason why I really truly believe this, but it's like why Kevin Costner gets cast all the time in movies that take place in like the 50s and 60s. Because like you take Kevin Costner <laughs> and you put him in one of those white shirts and those like sort of glasses from the 60s and you just buy it. It's like that guy exists in the 60s, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. like but, but if you put, you know, if, if you put like a really modern actor uh, in, in, in that, time period you might not buy it it's anachronistic you know it's like it's like you're talking about suddenly there's uh uh you know there's a tesla in the middle mm-hmm. of 1950s america and it's like that doesn't make sense you know? yeah and, well it, it's funny because when you talk about kevin costner in the 50s and 60s i go like it'd be like a red-headed guy because we're so used to thinking of vintages as in black and white. If all of a sudden your main actor is like got like, you know, red hair or something or a red beard, you'd go, that guy probably didn't exist back then, even though he did. You know, there was people with red hair back in the You 50s have to give him a six- specific hairstyle, you <laughs> yeah. know, like, like with lots of brill cream or something like that yeah. and a, a twirly mustache. And that's the part, but it's, it's fascinating what you're talking about, about the details. And I think that that's why most people think, oh, one day I'll make a movie because it would be easy and and they don't understand that the people that get it right are very few and far between and those are why they're famous or successful filmmakers because it's a very very hard craft to get right yeah i mean it's it's super complicated and and like i said for me personally uh i'm just constantly learning and constantly making mistakes and constantly every it's like with every shot with every project it's like you follow your gut and you go with it and you surround yourself with great people and who are going to get it right but it's like you have to be so vigilant you know you really it's like I needed to see that person who didn't look like a cop in the shot and maybe on a different day with less time constraints I would have it would have I would have caught it on set but this time it was just like it was the it was like the the the, the least of all evils you know i i needed to keep moving uh, it, it is it, it's really hard mm-hmm. I, I remember somebody once saying that directing is easy and i remember thinking like i don't know i don't i never found it easy it's fun but i never found it easy you know it's 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 really it, it's like you have to you have to be like you have to be hyper vigilant, and the fact is, is that if your let's say your props department isn't strong, it's like it's that, up to you. Well, yeah, and it's like it's suddenly you're like going, okay, get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. Yeah, I, I remember once. Here's a story. Uh, uh, this is from a purely cinem, a pure cinematography perspective. I once was shooting a film that somebody else was directing, and uh, it. it Here, talk about affecting the creative based on a business perspective, which is a whole other podcast into itself. But we were, it was a very busy time. It was a very low budget thing. We didn't have the money to hire a top crew. I had a camera assistant and the camera assistant, their main goal, thing to do at that time was to, to get the focus right. So so when, when you're in a shot, when an actor moves in the shot, uh, the camera assistant actually changes the focus 
on the lens in order to keep them in focus. So right. you want to keep the actor in focus and then the background goes out of focus or it shifts in the shot. So we were doing a shot. I set up a shot and my camera assistant, who was very inexperienced, couldn't get the focus right. They just couldn't get the focus to hit. So they couldn't get the actor walking through this shot in focus. It was sort of a long lens. We were also shooting film. So every time you roll the camera, it's expensive. And and we did take after take after take after take. And eventually we just, we couldn't get it. And we were running out of time. We couldn't get the shot. So I put a wider lens on. And, 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 and the shot was, I didn't like the shot at all. But we needed to get one in focus because the camera assistant couldn't get the right. focus. And so it was like this, it was like, so I, so the point is, is that if you, if the people around you aren't like at the top of their game, then that can affect exactly what goes on. And that shot is like, whatever. Now it's this kind of ugly shot, you know, it's yeah. like wider shot. We were in a place where we needed to have some shallow focus, but we didn't have it anymore because of the wide lens. And it was like, I had to do this because of the camera system. Not to mention that, I mean, everybody understood what was going on on set and understood my choice. But then several months later, when they were editing the film, I remember the director coming to me and saying, ma'am, like, you guys really botched the focus on that shot. You guys couldn't get the focus on that shot. And then we ended up with this ugly shot. And I was like, and and, and the director was also a producer and had hired this assistant. Yeah. And I was like, oh. Man, so now I'm wearing this. Like they're sitting in the edit suite, going like, "Ah, oh, Jay couldn't make it work." And I was like, <laughs> "Ah, God, you guys gave me this person, you know? Yeah. You gave me this person, and uh, and now I'm wearing it." So, yeah. anyways, yeah, you know, it, I go back to a story we were shooting a television commercial on film uh, back in the 35 millimeter film days. So again, expensive and and complicated and, and labor and, you know, time consuming just to, to move cameras and shots. And we have a storyboard and we're using a, uh, you know, a, a, a professional, sorry, a celebrity talent whose agent has agreed that they're coming for the day when they show up to tell us that they're not there for the day. I, you know, I can give you an hour here. So I have to, convince them to give me the first hour, go away and do what it is that they needed to do that day to then come back and give me another two hours at the end of the day. I have to rewrite my entire script to work around their schedule. Anyways, long story short, we shoot it, we're finished. And I turn to my DOP at that time and I go, wow, that was really complicated. I'm so grateful we managed to pull it off. And he's like, what? He had no idea that as the director, I'd had to completely rework everything in my head to know that we would end up with something in the editing suite that we could turn into a 30 second television commercial. And I went home that night and I was like, does anybody understand the stress that you're under when you're on set? Yeah, I totally agree. I'm talking with Canadian film and content producer Jay Ferguson. Jay shares what inspired him to be a filmmaker, and spoiler alert, it was that epic 70s film. But not until a little television show lifted the curtain. Were there any moments in your life where the light went off, where you could see, I'm going to do this? You know, like some people will say, I was in a movie theater when I was eight years old, I saw this movie and I knew I wanted to do that, or, you know... is there anything that happened in your life that you can go back to and remember as a, as a key moment of you decided that you can draw that line? Like, Oh, I, I, I can see how I became, or was it all just random occurrences and, you know, happenstance? No, look at, I mean, for better or for worse, I've always been obsessed with filmmaking and uh, I say for better or for worse. Cause I kind of wish that I had been obsessed with ophthalmology <laughs> Because, you know, I've done the calculations in my head about like what an ophthalmologist can earn. And I think like, man, I could, you know, I could work two or three days a week and probably make a pretty good living and, you know, take up golf or something like that. But that was never my passion, unfortunately. Uh, I, I've i always been really into it. And, and the fact is, is that, yeah, there are certain events, I think, that happen. Uh, uh, one, I've always been a pretty visual person. I've seen the world in a visual way so that when I discovered a camera 
and and I was never a stills guy. Like I, I, I mean, I took pictures when I was a kid, but stills were not my passion. Uh, but when uh, when I could see that you, with a camera that you could take pictures like that, actually genuinely excited me. I would say that not thinking that it was something I wanted to do necessarily, but I have to say that you know I was born in 1969, and when I was seven years old, a movie called Star Wars came mm-hmm, out. Yeah, and it's like I know it's such a tired story in some ways that being inspirational, but it really I didn't watch Star Wars and say, gee, I want to be a filmmaker. I didn't even know there were filmmakers. I was just sitting in a movie theater watching a story going like, that's incredible. Um, What happened to me was that I became obsessed, like all my friends with this movie, just as a, as a, as a piece of storytelling. And then there was like this special on TV. Like this is like way before DVDs or this is years before VHS. This is years before there was basically movie theaters and television. Yeah. And, uh, and there was a TV special where they showed like the making of star Wars. And it was an hour long thing. I, I think it was an hour. And they were showing like behind the scenes footage which I had never seen before. And it was like quite literally, you know, you'd see the camera and a person with a boom and they'd come out and and there's the actors running out and pretending to shoot their guns and there's no lasers coming out. And it was like kind of like, oh, it was like behind the curtain. And I remember, I still remember, I was probably seven or eight years old when I saw this. And I remember thinking, people make this stuff like Mm -hmm. like people actually oh look there's a bunch of people making it it's not just happening on the screen and and that was when I first was like okay I want to know more about it now but that was just a curiosity right then you know I got involved in theater many years later and the storytelling process and then I actually went to university to go to theater school and I was in theater school and there was I saw a Bolton board up and it was saying, looking for actors for student films. And I was like, wow, like a student film, like somebody here is making a film. And I just instantly was like, I need to know what that's about. And so I met some people in the cinema department and then quickly transferred over to the film department and then just became obsessed with the technology and everything around it. Uh, but so for me, I was just always interested. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is a combination of being totally fascinated with it and also these kind of things that just kind of kept happening. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's reminding me of something I read years ago about when, you know, films were, you know, black and white and only seen in theaters. And I can't remember who it was, but they were referencing the fact that films are the closest thing we have to human dreaming, Meaning like in a, in, in, in our dreams, we can jump. We're at the top of the stairs. We're at the bottom of the stairs. We don't have to see ourselves go down the stairs and film works in the same way, which the reason why we accept films is because we dream like that. And so I'm always fascinated with how people love the behind the scenes making of anything to do with television, filmmaking. Like they just love to get, you know, outside the box and see what's, you know, how did this come together? And, and I, and I equate that to, it'd be like, if we were able to figure out how our dreams came together, like we would all love to know, you know, how does that work? You know? And so I think that that's the magic behind filmmaking is, is there something different than, you know, like, I don't think there's a lot of people that are really that curious on how a book is written. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting because it's like, we know it's artifice, right? But it's, we, you know, when we sit down, obviously we don't believe any of this stuff is actually happening, but we get lost in the excitement of it. We get to watch it in a way that it transports you away and, 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 and you're in a story and you're, and you're l- l- engaging in characters and you're making friends in a way. Uh, and it's like, it's a trick. It's like, it's like a magician in a way. And it's like, who doesn't love when you get to learn how the trick is done, right? Yeah. So somebody does a trick and part of you says like, I don't want to know how it's done. But the other part of you is like, oh, I really want to know how this trick is done. And when you see it, you go, oh man, amazing. 
Welcome back. I'm with Canadian film and content producer Jay Ferguson, who is sharing the importance of reflecting on your mistakes to ensure you grow as a visual storyteller. You know, it's really important to reflect, actually, because that's how you learn, right? That's how you get better at something, uh, and is reflecting. Uh, obviously, you don't want to live in the past. I mean, I mean, I at one point early on in my career, I rejected everything that I had done prior to whatever today was because I was like, I'm not living in the past. I'm moving on. You know, I'm not even going to wear the T-shirt from that production because it's like that's living in the past. You know, right? Uh, I was really obsessed with being moving forward, but I, I think the problem with that is that then sometimes maybe you don't learn from your mistakes you just repeat your mistakes right um i i I do like thinking about past projects um i don't do it a lot but but it is important it is important to kind of step back and go like what did i do i mean i think that it's like you know i i repeat my mistakes a lot uh, or i have over the course of my career repeated the same mistakes uh and 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 I think that as I get older, I'm realizing that it's important to look back on what you've done. Uh, so what would those what what would be those mistakes? Oh boy, I, I think it's like the I'd say right now the biggest my biggest flaw that I'm working on right now uh, is in terms of storytelling is that I feel that. Um, and again, this isn't necessarily a past mistake, but uh, no, it's it's kind of a mistake. It's a problem is that I think that I, in the last number of years, have tended towards, in terms of storytelling, I've tended more towards plot than character. Hmm. And it's And that sounds simple, but it's like I've always, because I got into a period where I was doing a lot of thrillers, and thrillers are really all about plot. I mean, characters total obviously equally as important but i think that i leaned on plot and for me plot is easy uh moving a story forward a b c d e f g that that's that's actually easy making sure that the character's motivation is pushing the story forward is the thing that i'm really focusing on now because i think that i've I, i've that's been my weakness lately is that is that i'm letting the plot push as opposed to the character whereas i think it it requires both you know right. and and in fact it requires both but if you were going to if you were going to lean in one direction more than the other it should be character it should be character over plot hmm. like the character will drive the plot the plot can't drive the character uh otherwise you have a character who's not making choices and I think that that's when you start to lose your audience because then the character just becomes a victim of circumstances rather than the person who you're like going, oh yeah, go, you know, like, 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 like either, you know, taking it on and doing their best to push forward. So, so for me right now, I would say that I would look back on the last number of projects I've done and said like, oh wow, man, you really were heavy on plot here mm -hmm. and the character was kind of along for the ride. Whereas, you know, you need to be better at that. So when I think of plot character scenarios, I think of, you know, a plot scenario being like Lucille Ball in the chocolate factory where she's just like the, the, the plot of outs coming these chocolates, she's shoving them in her, in her mouth. And so I'm wondering if when you're writing comedy, if there's a, you know, what makes, cause they all say that, you know, sometimes writing comedy is the hardest thing to do. And is it because you, you, you might have this funny story you want to tell this funny plot line, but then you got to go into figuring out, okay, well, how do I make a character make those choices so that this plot becomes real? Yeah. And I mean, it's like the Lucy example is a great one. It's like, that is such a, you know, an iconic moment of comedy. Um, but, but the thing that makes that moment so great is that 
you know these characters, right? Like you know who they are and you know why they're there. And and it's like suddenly, you know, they're they're, they're under scrutiny that they're going to lose their job because mm-hmm. and 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 that's why they're doing this. And then you can run this gag and it goes on and on. But it's because there are real life implications for the character uh, that the characters are going to lose their job if they if if this becomes a problem and if they get caught. <laughs> and and so like there's actual like there's behind the stuffing chocolates in your mouth it's like literally a a drama unfolding of like this person could lose their job and that's why it's that's why it's so great but it's based on the character you don't want them to lose their job if you didn't buy into the character or if the character wasn't choosing to be there like the characters are like they could have just said ah this job isn't worth it. i'm gonna go find another job and walk away but it was like these characters decide okay i'm gonna do everything i can to keep this job like it's a choice a character choice mm-hmm. you know I, I don't know if, if no that that's works, great that's but... a good example of you know the whole because we always hear about oh that actor was committed to the role well that's commitment the commitment is no i've chosen to be here you know in my um day I did a little bit of improv you know and I just dabbled in it because I used it as a hobby and I enjoyed it and um but I would find myself at times I wouldn't commit to the character because in improv it's all yes than right Right. so somebody would come into a scene and they'd decide that you're my husband and I'd decide I don't want to be that person's husband and I would I would refuse to commit Right. And all great actors and all great comedic actors are just so good at they just commit you know, and she was committed to getting every one of those chocolates off that belt, right? <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, I, I mean, I think that it's, uh, yeah, it's it's a, it, it's really important. And, and that's, I mean, that's the thing is that I think that we want to watch, for the most part, we want to watch characters that are making choices. That characters, whether they're the right choices or the wrong choices, I mean, certainly we have this long fascination of, uh, of, of, characters who are constantly making the wrong choices and we want to watch what happens but they got to commit to them yeah they they need to commit to they can't just be halfway and i think that i grew up in a very stable household i grew up in a in a household with very little conflict and uh i think sometimes for me uh I avoid conflict even in my work and it's not because I want to, but it's because that's ingrained in me. Uh, and, and it's like, what's really satisfying is when you really commit to the conflict Mm -hmm. of the storytelling and that the characters are like buy in. And it's not just like this sort of, Oh, maybe I'm committed. Maybe I'm not committed to it, but it's like full commitment of the characters. And so I think that to me, it's like I'm constantly learning, and and this is what I'm really focusing on right now: the character, and uh, and and I I'm I'm really enjoying it. You know, it's mm-hmm. I'm learning a lot. So speaking about commitment, if you were to you know speak to a younger you, or you were to speak to somebody younger starting out. You know, uh, if you were to mentor somebody who says, you know, I want to be a filmmaker, I want to create, or I want to be a content creator, what what advice would you have for them? There's a piece of advice that is not my own that I like to use that was uh, actually, <laughs> I believe it's attributed to uh, Rick Emmett, who was a guitarist, a Canadian guitarist in the band Triumph, I think. Yeah. I hope I got that <laughs> right. Anyways, I think somebody came up to him and said like, I want to be a musician. And he said, if you want to be a musician, don't bother. But if you have to be a musician, then it's like the best thing in the world. And I kind of feel the same way. It's like I've met a lot of people over the years who kind of wanted to be in the film business, but they weren't driven to be in it. So I think it's like a real, you have to check your gut on the most fundamental level because it's never going to be easy. Uh, it's always going to be an uphill struggle, no matter how successful you are. It's always going to be a battle. When you're talking about making TV shows or making movies or making any kind of content, it costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of money to do that. Each one is a new business venture. And try to imagine going out and starting a new business every year doesn't matter how successful you are 
when people have money, they're going to find every reason not to give it to you because mm-hmm. they're trying to be smart about their money. I, I get it. You know, it's like, we're not, you know, every person who walks up to you in the street says, I got a great idea for a business. Yeah. Like, you don't <laughs> just write them a check. Right. Right. You can't. So, so it's always going to be a battle and you just have to make sure that you're ready to do that battle uh, continually and be passionate about it. And that, that, that passion is driving you and that you're getting something out of it. Uh, like on the, on the most fundamental level, I would say you got to be passionate about it. You got to have to want to do it. And even the most passionate of us who have been doing it for a long time, you know, we have our moments where it's just like, Oh, what am I doing? I got to get out of this business. I got to get out of this business. It's ridiculous. But, but then what would you do? What would you do if you weren't able to do this? I said to my wife a few years ago, I said, you know, if I had put as many hours into being a lawyer as I have put into filmmaking, like the 18 hour days, seven days a week, years and years and years, I said like, I would be a partner in a Bay Street firm making so much money right now. It would be incredible. And she said, yeah, but then you'd have to be a lawyer. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I, I don't think I want to be a lawyer. <laughs> I'm interested in lawyers and I'm interested in the law and I find it very fascinating. But you, but... you want to play a lawyer or shoot a story <laughs> about lawyers. Totally. Yeah. I'm happy to. I, I just wrote something the other day. There's a legal element to this script that I'm working on. And I, I wrote like a very lawyerly thing which was very satisfying I felt like a, a big shot lawyer writing like you know what it must feel like to be on Bay Street writing a contract if I was like oh man this wording is so perfect I'm sure it's terrible legally <laughs> but it sounded really lawyerly um, but the fact is is that like I don't have that passion I know a lot of lawyers who are extremely passionate about being lawyers and they're really good at it and 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 they're successful because they're passionate about it I don't know if I have the passion to be a lawyer. Uh, so, so you know, I, it just doesn't translate, right? Like, And so your point is, is exactly correct. I'm kind of stuck in this world. I'll never leave it. Mm-hmm. I'll always be a part of it. And uh, I guess I just have to, uh, uh, I think I've kind of come to terms with that. Uh, well, uh, on that note... <laughs> It's great that you've come to the realization that you're meant to be doing what you do because you do it very well and you've done an incredible volume of work over the years. Um, Some of the things that you've done have started to bridge, you know, into the the new technology world of, you know, like I, I remember talking to another, you know, filmmaker saying, oh, I went to school and I just dreamed about having my film up in that movie theater and now people look at it on a phone while they ride the subway. Mm. Um, how, how has that journey been for you? Like seeing, you know, you know, you're talking filmmaker, filmmaker, you know, filmmaker. And then you say at the beginning, Oh, I'm a content creator because that's the new term for the stuff that ends up on the phone. Right. How, how does that feel? Or are you just accustomed to it now? You know, it's interesting because in terms of alternative forms of storytelling outside of what was traditionally uh, film and television, and I don't know what the demographic is of the people who are going to be listening to this, but it was like a bunch of us grew up on film and television. There was sort of a certain way of telling a story. Right. And now that has exploded in the last, you know, less than 10 years. That has exploded in terms of how do you tell a story. And for some weird reason, I've never really been ahead of the curve on anything, but for some reason I got ahead of the curve on uh, new forms of storytelling. And I got involved very early on and in fact, uh, you know, spent a lot of time and energy kind of trying to figure out what this new world is and actually building models for it. Uh that was never the intention. That just happened almost out of necessity. The journey is, has been, uh, how do I put it? It's been 
exhilarating because it, I've been a part of a community that has really uh, redefined what it is to tell stories to audiences. And at the same time, tremendously frustrating because when you're being forced to innovate, my intention never was to innovate. My intention was to tell stories in a different form. But when you're talking about a different form, ultimately in the end, you're innovating. And, and in that innovation, there's all sorts of things that come along with it. And it's like, you know, lack of financing, having to try and figure out how to do things better for cheaper. Uh, it's about, uh, having to take on more and more jobs. And I mean, like having to take on more responsibility in the project to try and see it through because the regular channels don't exist anymore. So it, it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's like more hard work than anything. And, uh, but it's really gratifying because it's also, uh, it's also like when, when it works, it, it really is fun and exciting. So, uh, I, I would just say that it's like, it's like anything, you know, sometimes I just wish that, uh, I was working, uh, in films again, because there's mm -hmm. like just a format and a process that was, you know, over a hundred years was like established and you kind of just follow the right. plan. But it's like when you start getting into digital content, while certain things are starting to land, there's still no exact science to it. Welcome back. I'm with Canadian film and content producer Jay Ferguson, who's sharing his journey of being on the bleeding edge of innovation at the crossroads of the internet and storytelling. So I want to talk to you about Guidestones and 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 because you alluded to, you know, innovating and coming up with new ways of storytelling and Guidestones was absolutely something that was, you know, ahead of its time. Um, we joked about it years ago about being on the bleeding edge <laughs> of how we were going to do, you know, storytelling in, in, in sound bites and in, in that sort of way. How did that come about for you? Well, it started with, I was getting ready to go and raise some financing for some feature films. And a friend of mine said to me, well, and this is like 10 years ago. And they said, well, what about making content for the internet? You have to understand, in context, YouTube was one year old at that point. And that was what internet content was. And it wasn't sophisticated. It was like cat videos, right? Right, yeah. And I remember thinking, and it was short form. And I never worked in short form. And I didn't work in cat videos. <laughs> so I was like, well, what am I? No, like, oh, this is just doesn't make sense to me. Then I thought back. To, or then I started to think, well, what if you made short form content? Because right now the internet at the time is about short form content. I said, but what if you did serialized short form content? And I thought back to my father who grew up going to the movie theater like and and – and he used to tell me about the serials that would play, like, a, like the you know there'd be the the main picture, but beforehand there'd be like you know these stories, like quite literally the bad guy tying the woman to the train tracks, right. and then it'd be a cliffhanger. Oh my God, what's going to happen? And then the good guy the next week would sweep along, and it was like these short serialized content. And I and and, and that popped into my head when I was thinking. About, I thought, well, maybe what if you made short form serialized content? that could be on the web and and what would be unique about it would be that you'd bring some production value to it like that's what I knew how to do I knew how to make something look good um and professional so maybe um I could do that and now at the time the term web series didn't exist mm -hmm. it was like like I literally went around so I, what I did was I raised a little bit of money and uh started this company uh, that looked into this idea of like creating short form serialized content for the internet. And like, that's what it was called. It was like, I, I wasn't <laughs> smart enough to come up with web series. It was like, it was like short form serialized content. 
Uh, and and so I spent a couple of years playing with that, and I uh, started writing content in that form, 10-minute uh, episodes, uh, six to 10-minute episodes uh, that had cliffhangers at the end so that it would keep the audience hooked. And... And then I found some like-minded people who thought, oh, this is interesting, an interesting idea. And maybe we should explore this. And at the time, you know, there were all sorts of technological issues, like how are people going to watch this? And like bandwidth was a thing, which mm -hmm. like, who's heard that term anymore? But <laughs> yeah. we literally would sit around and talk about, but the bandwidth is so expensive. How are people going to be able to stream video content? You know, it's going to be, there's not enough bandwidth, you know? <laughs> and like, that was really genuinely a problem. But for me, the reason why I even got into it, because I thought this is a new place that maybe there's a business model for this. So um, what I started doing was that I started building Guidestones and Guidestones, so rather than just being a web series, which is, um, uh, which which obviously nowadays there's, I mean, I don't know if you call them web series, but it's like, you know, short form serialized content or web series. They, they exist like crazy. But at the time I was like, okay, I'm going to create that or build something that looks like that. But then there was all these other applications that I added to it because I was trying to figure out how to make it financially viable. So, uh, I added these elements of interactivity to it. So one of the things about Guidestones is that while it's serialized, I added this interactive element to it and and there was very specific reasons for that because I thought, okay, when you're online, if you're watching something online, you've got the internet right at, at, at your fingertips and um, so wouldn't it be cool if there were things you could do on the internet while you're watching the show mm -hmm. or in between watching the show? And so I created this interactivity. So for instance, every episode uh, ends in a cliffhanger. and But there's something hidden in each one of those episodes that you as the user could Google or search. And that would allow you to kind of do what the protagonists are doing and get a little bit ahead of the story. So for example, if... Uh, if uh, in one of the episodes, a car goes by, a mysterious car, and you see the license plate number. You can Google the license plate number, and we built a website that if you Google that, it'll take you to that website, and then hidden on that website, there's information that takes you deeper into the story, and then maybe a hidden video that the, that the protagonists are going to find and that you'll see in the next episode. So it was this idea of how do we engage... Uh, uh, audiences online in the story but w without it being like a choose your own adventure because those things I don't think ever really work very well yeah um uh but uh but but it was like this idea of like oh I can interact with these characters and so we built like uh you know 40 or 50 websites and things and there's apps you can download and there's like songs that you could buy and all this stuff that's all part of the story world if you want to interact. If you don't, you just watch it and it'll all be, be revealed along the way. Um, one of the main reasons why I did this is because I thought we, if we want to finance this stuff, we're going to need brand partners. Right. So it's like I could drive people, I can drive the audience with a cool hook at the end, like with, 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 with a cliffhanger at the end of an episode and it's like, and you see a code and you go, okay, I got to Google that code. And then you Google it, like that could take you to like the Pizza Pizza website. And it's like, why am I at a Pizza Pizza website? And it's like, suddenly you're advertising for Pizza Pizza. And it's like, oh, if I go deeper, oh, there's a video in there that I want to watch because I want to know what's going on. And to me, it was this idea of how do you marry brand partnerships, which is you know an increasingly more important way to finance content with the actual experience that the audience is having. So uh, it was, in some ways, the interactivity, that side of it was really very much about, uh, was very much about why, like it was about brand integration. Yeah. But it's about innovation, which, as you said, you didn't, it wasn't your, your desire to innovate, but you had to figure out ways to make this work and survive so that you could tell your story. And I think that 
at that time you had shared with me a, a kind of sad but true story about going into a major broadcaster, pitching them the concept of this uh, of the success of the first season of Guidestones to get a, a you know a broadcaster behind you and get some funding. And, and, and you, there was these big high fives on their part because they loved everything. And they wrote you a check that was the equivalent of what you would get paid for a 30 minute, um, series, like, you know, sitcom series or whatever for 18 episodes of your stuff. Right. And it was like the world just hadn't woken up to the fact that we're going to be consuming this content online in a huge way very soon. But that was a time when they were still, oh yeah, here you go. But because it's the internet, we're going to take, you know, three of the zeros off the end of the check and hand it to you. It's totally true. And it's it, it hasn't completely changed. Uh, but I remember at the time uh, going in, uh, the series was as successful as it could possibly have been. And 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 we were still functioning on, and I did the math, it was a 10 to 1 ratio. So we had, for every $10 that a television show had to produce, uh, we had $1. And so, you know, the second season of Guidestones, which is 18 episodes, you know, I always say, like, we had financing for, like, the first... Uh, uh, the first two episodes and the last 16 were free. <laughs> and, 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 and that's like, from a television perspective, that was totally true. So we, I mean, I and my team had to be like super capable of building something really strong uh, with no money. And, and it's not, much better now uh it's getting a little bit better i think that um people who are who want content are beginning to realize that because you give five thousand bucks to somebody doesn't mean they're going to come back with something great you know you can give them a million bucks it doesn't mean they're going to come back with something great either right but the fact is is that if you want to develop something and build something that's a value you need to pay uh you know you need to pay like like good content costs money. Yeah. I've uh, always said, um, whenever we dealt with clients and budgets and things like that, I always said is the moment the check is written, they forget they didn't want it to be excellent. You know, so they'll sit there and they'll negotiate a cost with you down to like nickels and dimes on this is all we can afford. That's all we have the budget for. But the second they've written the check, they want it to be amazing. Right. And you never, and it's such a frustrating place to be because you're stuck going, okay, I'm going to over deliver. It will be three times better than the budget allows. And you're still going to be, you know, two times depressed about the end product, right? You're, you're going to be disappointed in the end product because you now think that you've bought this thing that's going to be amazing and it's not associated with the budget, you know? No, it, it's it's kind of like uh, it, it's. It, I mean, I, I just I, there's nothing to add to that comment. Like that is exactly correct, and it, it always amazes me that people come and they say like, "I got a thousand bucks to do this thing," and it's like, and and you go, "Okay, well, I mean, I guess you know, whatever. I guess we could throw something together for whatever," and 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 you kind of put it together, and then. And then they come back and then they start like attacking it like as though it was, you know, a hundred thousand dollar project. And it's like, well, you know, the reason why that's like that is because Yeah, we didn't have the budget. There's to... no money. And it's not this isn't about being like this is it's really important to realize that, you know, we have this notion of like the 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 film and television producer with their feet up on the desk smoking cigars eating caviar right but it's like in this country that that doesn't exist i mean there's a couple of people like that <laughs> uh, but for the most part a producer is a walking deferral um it's somebody who is deferring their fees back into the project for the most part in order to get the thing made to get the next thing made and, uh, and, and it's funny, you know, we, we think of the producers as being this person who, who is, who's, who's getting rich off of this, but it's like, 
I know a lot of producers and they're not getting rich. I mean, there are few who like tap into a franchise that become global franchises. And of course they should be getting rich because they're global franchises. But for the most part, we're making uh, projects that are, you, you, you're getting a fee. You're not making money on the back end. Like, right. like you don't make a lot of money on the back end. There's a few people who do, like I said, there are examples of it. But it's like it's not for the most part. Mostly, you're creating something that is that you're going to get paid a fee for, and and those fees aren't huge, you know. Especially because you're going to put like, look, I know so many documentary filmmakers who like, you know, maybe they get paid, let's just say, thirty or forty thousand dollars to do a documentary, but they may have to spend two or three years working on that documentary, like. 40 grand sounds like a lot of money, right? Like, oh, I got paid 40 grand to make that thing. But it's like three years of your life. It doesn't like turn out, do the math, right? It's like, right. it's not, nobody's getting rich doing it, you know? Yeah, you got to do it for love. Yeah. And uh, and we appreciate your love for doing it because you've done a lot of great work. And so how can I direct people to you? Like how, how can people find you, take a look at your stuff, uh, website, social media, anything like that? I think probably the best thing to do is to go, uh, if you want to see some of the stuff that we've done, is go to uh, our website, which is mira.studio. Um, if you go on there, you can see our reel, but you can also see samples of our projects. In fact, there's a bunch of stuff on that site that uh, Brian, you and I have collaborated right. on. Yeah. Uh, stuff that you've directed, that I've shot, or that we've produced together, or whatever it is. So there's some of that stuff. There's also some of our scripted stuff. There's things like guidestones on there as well. Uh, uh, go and check it out, and then and then if you if there's something on there that's interesting to you. Uh, uh, you'll be able to find it because most of this stuff is available online. You know, a lot cool. of it is digital based content. Yeah. Well, you know, Jay, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. I enjoy, I could talk forever. Well, thanks, Brian. It's been a real pleasure, actually. I've been, uh, it's been fun to talk about it. Great. Well, all the best. Thanks, Jay. Well, that's another episode of Listen In. Thanks for being. Please subscribe, leave comments, or head on over to our website at listeninpod.com. That's listen with two N's, pod.com, where you'll find episode notes, links to anything that we talked about in this episode, and you can connect with us about being a guest on Listen In.